good morning to all the participants. Uh, we will wait five more minutes so we can have more participants uh, that join to this session, okay? So we will start at 9, 5 a.m. Hello, uh, do you hear me? Hello, uh, could you write on the chat box if you hear me, please? I can, I can hear you, Adrian. Okay, okay, thank you, Ignacio. So, well, uh, good morning to all the participants. Uh, for Olade, it's a pleasure having you as part of this webinar cycle of distributed generation. First, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Adrián Moreno, and I'm an energy consultant that we will support to conduct this webinar cycle. About the sessions, I would like to give some instructions to all the participants. First, we will have uh, about 40 to 45 minutes presentation, and then we will have 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. All the questions can be written in the chat box 
on that is on the right side on your screen. And after the presentation, I will read the questions so the speaker can answer them, okay? Uh, uh, all the questions will be uploaded to the system by a PDF file, so you can check them after the session. Uh, to start this session, I uh, would like to introduce our speaker, Mr. Ignacio Romero, who is from Argentina. Ignacio is a renewable energy and energy efficiency consultant expert. Presently, he, ha he was conducting the regulation, implementation, and promotion of renewable distributed generation in Argentina. He was director of distributed generation at the Energy Secretariat of Argentina and during his period led the regulation and implementation of distributed generation national law. Uh, he participated from the law project drafting and parliamentary discussion, analysis and regulation of all administrative, legal, legally, tax, technical, economic, and promotional aspects. He has international experience on managing programs and projects in renewable energy, project direction, engineering, manufacturing, business development, operative efficiency, and others. Uh, Romero is Fulbright Fellow, Electronic and Communication Engineer, uh, Master of Science in Engineering Management, and has postgraduate studies in project management and direction in engineering leadership, regulation of the electrical sector, renewable energies, and macroeconomy. So I would like uh, uh, to start with this uh, session. So I will give uh, uh, the, the word for uh, Ignacio Romero. Please, Ignacio, go ahead. Hello, thank you very much, Adrian. And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar session. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, sharing some of the things uh, that we've been doing in Argentina and also a perspective of uh, what's happening in Latin America. Um, we are going to have three webinar series, uh, three webinar sessions uh, today, tomorrow and on Friday. We are trying to, we will try to, to look at this um, from a regulatory perspective and try to analyze different aspects of uh, distributed generation in particular to, uh, for the Latin American um, region. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of uh, studies of uh, other countries that have a more uh, a longer track record in this uh, kind of implementations, but there's uh, really amazing progress in uh, recent uh, years uh, in, in Latin America. So we're gonna have an overview of uh, what's going on in, in some of the countries in Latin America today. Then tomorrow we're going to talk about uh, different um, mechanisms for distributed generation that you uh, most have heard of probably, such as uh, feed-in tariff, net metering, and net billing. We're going to comment a little bit about net metering and net billing today, but mostly that discussion will be tomorrow, as well as um, our experience uh, regulating the, the Argentinian um, distributed generation law and. Uh, some of the ideas that uh, that we implemented that uh, that thing that I think are worth uh, mentioning, and then finally on Friday we're gonna try to look at a broader scope of challenges and uh, what's the impact, the benefit of uh, distributed generation in Latin America. Of course, uh, we all know um, the emission reduction is 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 the the ultimate goal of uh, renewable. Uh, generation and the decarbonization of the electrical sector but there's a lot of other aspects that are really important that i think we can we can uh, highlight and, and discuss so um having said this and i hope uh, you all have uh, your coffees or mate in hand we're going to start with the, with the discussion we're going to do an overview um, on these uh, different countries. We're going to start with, the, with an international forecast on uh, what's being um, expected to happen um, globally with distributed generation, and then have a quick uh, overview on, on these different markets. Of course, uh, we're, we won't be able to dive into every detail because each uh, regulation is, uh, is complex. Uh, but I think there's some trends and, and some ideas that uh, that are normal, that are common in all these uh, different implementations, and I think uh, we can we can pick some of these aspects uh, to, to 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 analyze and uh, and discuss. 
So let's just start by looking at uh, what the international forecasts are. So some, some of the things might not be surprising or will not be surprising if you've been following the renewable uh, energy sector, in particular the uh, photovoltaic, solar photovoltaic uh, technology. But uh, it's interesting to see that uh, even, I mean, having seen uh, a dramatic decrease in the cost of uh, solar uh, PV technology in the past 10 years, which is at around 90% from 2010 to 2020, we see what's more interesting looking into the future is that uh, these trends are expected to, to continue. Uh, this is a, a projection from IRENA in a report that I have linked uh, there for you if you want to look at the details. But basically what's interesting is that the, the installation cost of, of solar PV projects is expected to continue to uh, dramatically decrease uh, in cost. So this is for utility scale um, projects, but you see that um, this research is expecting to uh, to reach uh, prices in the range of 340 to 830 uh, dollars per kilowatt by 2030, uh, compared to the you know 1.2 uh, dollars per watt that we see today. This is, as I said, utility scale, but then again. Solar PV uh, is uh, is influenced by this and pretty much follows this trend. Uh, small scale installations are a bit more expensive, but uh, on Friday we're going to see some uh, recent data from from uh, from Argentina and maybe other markets, and, and we'll see that these numbers are not far away. So I think that the the um, takeaway from this is that the technology is here to stay, and it's not only um accessible today but it will continue to become even more accessible in the near future something that's also interesting is that the distributed solar pv uh, generation is also expected to increase uh very rapidly in the coming years uh, this uh, report by iaea uh, expects that the uh, the increase in capacity will be uh, about 250 percent globally uh, this was from 2019 to 2024. Um, so it, basically, it's a it's an expansion that more than doubles compared to what we've seen in the recent uh, years. I, I really recommend uh, if you want to have a global perspective on on uh, distributed generation. This is a great report that actually uh, addresses distributed generation. Most reports only talk about utility scale, but this is a really good source of information. We'll, we'll see some more information about this report. So from an international point of view, um, the, the expectation, as I said, it's a great growth in the, in the next couple of uh, years. Uh, they, they're separating a main case and an optimistic or accelerated case. But in any case, something that, uh, that's interesting here is that uh, China, I mean, of course, Latin America here is, uh, it, it's still very minimal. I think this will change because uh, Latin America is growing really, really fast um, in the coming years. But what's interesting here is that China uh, accounts for 50% of the global capacity increase. And uh, this is uh, something that is not only good for China, but it's also good for the entire distributed the entire distributed generation but in particular uh, pv industry because uh, most of the growth in uh, or most of the cost reduction let's say in this technology and the developments have been fueled not only by international demand but also by china's uh, huge um, local uh, internal market so while this is uh, good for china in the case in, in the sense that they are going to increase their their um, distributed PV participation. It's also good for everyone because this means that they're going, there's still going to be a huge demand for this technology and continue to push prices uh, down. So this will benefit everyone. Now uh, we're going to start looking, I know everyone's looking at uh, COVID curves these days, and this is something that's very worrying. We're gonna look at a few curves that uh, will uh, we'll hopefully give us hope, let's say, in a couple of minutes. But uh, before doing that, this is something also 
that, that we're going to see in the in the countries that we're going to review. But it's also interesting to see that this is a global trend. So as, as we said, the, the, the increase is going to be dramatic. And if you look at the forecast for uh, the next coming years, we'll see that um, this black diamond here is the percentage of distributed PV over total PV is going to be around 50%, which is uh, really, really a, a lot uh, in, the, in the global mix. But also we see here that uh, commercial industrial systems represent most of the capacity growth. And this is a trend that we'll see in, in, in basically most of the countries that we're going to review. Uh, while residential installations are more in number, the capacity uh, of, of uh, commercial industrial systems is uh, usually larger. And there's a lot of factors that um, come into play here. Maybe we'll, we'll be able to mention a few going along. So now let's get to the, to the night herbs. <laughs> so basically, we're going to start uh, reviewing from larger to uh, smaller uh, in basis of installed capacity. All this information that we're going to look uh, at today is um, is based on publicly available information, and I have uh, referred the source on all of these uh, slides. So if you want to take a look, you can go and, and download the updated uh, information. So basically, let's start with Brazil. So Brazil has uh, implemented net metering, um, which means which means that the excess energy that is injected to the grid uh, is uh, rewarded at retail price, that is at the same price uh, that the consumer pays when they are um, demanding energy from the grid. Um, this uh, normally is uh, very simple to understand to the customers because uh, to them they are only transacting, um, they're only trading energy and they almost forget about the cost of energy or the price of energy. Um, we're going to talk about the, the details, uh, a lot more about these details tomorrow. But <clears throat> basically, we see that they have a net metering uh, scheme with a top limit, a maximum system size of 5 megawatts. And they had an increase of more than doubling their, um, they, they, they basically tripled their install capacity from 2018 to 2019, which is uh, really dramatic. We have partial information from 2020. So uh, we see that from the numbers that we have already that go uh, all the way to um, June, this, uh, this trend continues. And uh, uh, it will be interesting to see what, what happens at, uh, at year's end. But, uh, uh, so far, we we already know that there's 3.3 gigawatts of installed solar capacity. Something that we're going to also look at all when we go through all these countries is um, the average system size. Uh, so in this case, it's uh, 12.5 kilowatts. So you see there's a big difference between maximum allowed uh, system size and the actual average uh, size of the installations. We're going to discuss a bit more at the end. But also, we're going to uh, highlight some other, um, other possibilities that these regulations uh, implement. So for example, in Brazil, they also implemented uh, excess credit sharing and remote metering, as well as uh, self-consumption. We're going to talk a bit more about that. But um, so if we look at. Um, the different uh, sectors in which uh, these installations are happening, we'll see, and uh, we'll see this trend pretty much everywhere. So we see that residential installations, as I said, in quantity are most of uh, the installations. But then when we go to, uh, to the capacity, as, uh, as we said, and also as the global trend indicates, we see that uh, commercial, industrial, or in this case, uh, rural as well, make up most of the installed capacity. So this is this is an interesting um, thing to observe. Also, I highlighted uh, the rural sector here because uh, this is uh, there's a lot of, um, of agricultural um, industries and, and, and processes that 
require a, a lot of energy and that could really benefit from distributed generation. Um, in many cases, uh, from what I've seen uh, in Argentina, for example, there's a lot of, uh, of deep uh, of, of water pumping for irrigation in many places, and uh, this, has a, this is very intensive in electricity consumption. So I think there's a, a good potential there that may, may be different depending on the country, but, but it's, uh, it's nice to see that they're taking, uh, they're taking this opportunity, they're, they're, they're taking this benefit. When we look at the technologies, um, this is something that uh, maybe I, I won't even mention in the next coming cases because uh, as we all know, solar PV rules the distributed generation um, industry. It's mostly because of the, the cost of technology and uh, um, how easy it is to um, integrate solar panels to architecture. Um, but it's interesting to see that Brazil not only enables different technologies, but even if, if this seems uh, small, 3% uh, or 2% in hydropower or biogas, uh, biomass, it, it, it's not common. This is something that, uh, that's pretty unique and we're gonna see in, in very few countries. So it's interesting to see that by allowing different technologies and not only solar PV, which is the most obvious um, decision, you might be taking advantage of other opportunities that are there and that could benefit more um, consumers and also um, provide more clean energy into the grid. Now when we go to, um, as I said, Brazil has um, two other mechanisms uh, as well as self-consumption. So self-consumption will be an, an end a user of electricity that installs a system on their own uh, building or house, and uh, they, they, they basically self-consume and inject the excess energy at that same point of injection. But also um, the credit sharing uh, mechanisms, which sometimes are also referred as um, community solar, which means that there's a single installation uh, that injects or feeds energy into the grid, but also the, the, but the credits from these uh, energy injections are distributed uh, among different uh, consumers. This is something that's been enabled. Uh, so far, it hasn't had a lot of push. We'll see what happens in the, in the coming years. What's really interesting is that remote net metering has had uh, a really interesting participation in Brazil. So remote net metering, or also called virtual net metering, is when the same consumer has a, um, has a generation system at a different point of injection. So maybe a company has a more uh, space or a larger surface to install uh, solar panels at one location, but then has a higher consumption or electricity demand at a different location, and they can uh, transfer automatically the credits from injection from one um, point to the other. I think it's interesting to see the 20% the, the participation here by remote net metering in Brazil that I have not seen in, in, in other countries. So now going to the second largest uh, market um, here, which also has seen uh, really, really great uh, numbers and a dramatic increase. We don't have 2020 numbers uh, yet, at least not uh, publicly available, available, but we can see uh, that Mexico also implementing net metering. Uh, Mexico has a very interesting regulation because they enable at the same time three mechanisms that a consumer can choose. Um, we'll see a bit more about this in the next slides, but they, they allow the, the consumer to pick either net metering or net billing or sell all, which is basically just selling every, all, all, all energy to the grid uh, at the, uh, the marginal price, which is uh, the location of marginal price, which is similar to what a spot price would be in, 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 um, in different countries, right? So Mexico has a limit of uh, 500 kilowatts, a maximum system size of 500 kilowatts, but we see that the average system size, again, is uh, considerably smaller. Uh, we see an average system size of uh, 7.5 uh, kilowatts. Here we see Mexico having 
by the end of 2019, actually almost one gigawatt of installed capacity. So uh, almost definitely, almost certainly by now they, they're over one gigawatt and it'll be interesting to see. But we see that the increase, a uh, 40% increase, of course, uh, well, after Brazil, let, let me just uh, tell you this in advance. After Brazil, everything looks small <laughs> because uh, because uh, that's uh, that's the industry that has the, the, the biggest uh, growth in the region. But 40% increase uh, year over year is really it, it's it's really um, important. And uh, probably, well, we'll see what happens in all of the countries with uh, with COVID and um, what impact it had in these trends, but uh, there's nothing nothing to indicate that these uh, trends are not going to continue going forward. So it's 130,000 systems and uh, almost one gigawatt by the end of 2019. Let's see what happened uh, technology-wise. So Mexico, again, enables um, all uh, renewable technologies on their distributed generation regulation but we see that uh, solar makes uh, pretty much uh, all of the um, all of the installed capacity and all of the uh, systems we see here uh, gas and diesel this is because um, the three generation um, law and regulation in, in Mexico was uh, was updated I, 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 I if I remember well a, a bit before 2015 from uh, from their small means of generation um, to distributed generation and they allowed these kind of, uh, of systems but then again solar um, dominates uh, this uh, market now when we look at the different uh, mechanisms we see that uh, unsurprisingly or, or maybe uh, as expected, net metering is uh, also dominating this uh, market. So again, just a brief um, explanation about the difference between net billing and net metering. We'll see the details tomorrow. But on net, 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 both net metering and net billing are uh, self-consumption mechanisms. So the user is allowed to generate and consume the, their own um, energy at the site. But when they inject energy to the grid, net metering um, rewards this uh, injection at retail price, which includes not only the cost of energy or the cost of generation, but also um, distribution costs and taxes. So it's a, it's a higher price than net billing, where you get rewarded just the generation cost and not the, um, the distribution component and taxes. Also, we see well both net billing and uh, sell all mechanisms are rewarded at the, the location and marginal price, which is basically the cost of generation. And we, we don't see a lot of pull here, but we're going to highlight some aspects that are interesting about why they uh, went with these uh, three systems at the same time and how they're uh, expecting to adapt going into the future. We'll see this uh, tomorrow when we talk about uh, these uh, differences in detail. Then, um, well, let's go to uh, somewhere warmer. Uh, now, Costa Rica, again, net metering um, mechanism. The limit uh, for Costa Rica is uh, one megawatt maximum size. We see that the average system size is higher, is larger than uh, in the case of Mexico and Brazil. So it's around 22 kilowatts. Um, there's almost uh, 2,000 systems already, and uh, and well, the 43 uh, megawatts uh, of private uh, installations, as well as 11 additional megawatts from uh, ICE's pilot program. So they, they have a total of 54 megawatts uh, already. Here um, we see that the that the trend is pretty pretty stable. Uh, on the past few years, we'll see what happens in 2020. We have very little information yet from from this year. So basically, a 50% increase in capacity. Again, it's a great news for the for the third generation sector in Costa Rica. When we look at technologies here, we see something that we also saw in Brazil. So um, different technologies are enabled. Solar PV dominates the scene. 
but then uh, there's there's a, a, a pretty interesting participation by by biogas here in Costa Rica. So it's 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 a this is something that might be uh, particular to to each um, case because to each country because uh, maybe wind and solar are not I wouldn't I wouldn't, I wouldn't say less solar is the the most uh, location independent uh, let's say because you also you always have the solar resource and unless, un, unless you have shading you you always have have some degree of uh, solar uh, irradiation that could be better or or, or or not so good, but there's always there. Wind, uh, well, it, it's a bit more location dependent, but then again, there's a, a lot of places, a lot of places with wind. Biogas, biomass, or hydro, uh, the resource is uh, much more uh, locational, but it's interesting. So that, that will depend on each country, but it's interesting to see that biogas is, uh, is almost 8% of the installed capacity in Costa Rica, so that provides some diversity to DG. Now uh, we're going to go to our neighbors uh, here in Chile. Um, also, uh, well, this this is uh, this is the first net billing uh, mechanism that we see. Um, basically, Chile implemented net billing uh, originally with a limit, the maximum limit of 100 kilowatts uh, for maximum system size. And then they increase that uh, system size to 300 kilowatts. But then again, we see that the average uh, installation size is uh, way uh, way lower. So we'll talk about what these uh, maximum uh, system in, um, limitations uh, impact is. But I, I don't think it's huge. I think uh, most of the installations are constrained by other factors other than the uh, maximum size of the regulation. So we see again, 50% uh, increase in uh, installed installations uh, in the last year and 100% uh, increase. So they doubled, as you see, their, their installed capacity in 2019. It's, uh, it's going to be interesting. 2020 numbers here go only to uh, May, but, um, but we'll see what the, the year end uh, Brings so basically, I, 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 it, it's hard to predict what the uh, what the impact of COVID with all the uh, restrictions uh, and the the economical impact uh, that it's uh, it's it, it's bringing to to all our countries uh, will be. But but uh, but but I think the trend will will probably continue. Maybe maybe uh, lower, but then uh, again, it, it's a really uh, active market and uh, they also have uh, another segment that's very interesting we're not going to discuss that today because even if it's called uh, distributed generation it's called me small means of distributed generation p um pmgd uh that goes all the way to nine megawatts it's it's closer to it it's mostly a sell all um mechanism at marginal prices and not a soft consumption uh, scheme, but they have a lot of installed capacity as well with that mechanism. If we look here at um, at different different sectors, uh, again, unsurprisingly, residential. Most of the installations are residential. But then, when you go to look at the capacity participation of residential systems, that's uh, that's not so much. Well, obviously, because uh, residential systems are smaller in size. Um, we see a lot of CNI, also rural installations, which is interesting uh, to, to see that they are taking benefit of this. And as well as education, the education uh, participation here is uh, pretty high. It's 11% of the installed capacity. And this is because Chile implemented a really good program called um, Public Solar Roofs, Techo Solares Públicos. Uh, where they uh, use this pilot program to not only install um, solar PV systems in, in a lot of public uh, buildings and, and, of course, a lot of um, schools, but they use this as a pilot program for the regular and the Ministry of Energy to, to have an insight on, on, on what the industry um, was doing and uh, how the regulation was impacting um the user side so basically they by installing their own systems 
they were able to test the regulation and improve the uh, technical requirements and the authorization process, uh, which I think is remarkable. Also, there's something very interesting if you want to look at. Uh, if you look for Techos Solares Publicos from Chile, you see that they have very interesting reports on pricing uh, for all these systems because they did public tenders and they published the full information of all the uh, the bids uh, with maximum and uh, minimum and, and average prices or awarded prices on all the different scales of systems, so different size of systems, and they have a a nice um, a nice perspective into the market, and they, they don't need to be pulled to go out polling. They have their own um, information and how prices are evolving. So this is something that's also interesting to check out. When we look at the technologies, again, Chile um, is very open to different technologies on distributed generation, solar PV dominate the market. Uh, something that I wanted to mention here that's a unique, as far as I know, unique to Chile in the region is that they also enabled cogeneration or secondary uh, generation in, uh, in the regulation. This is not renewable generation, strictly speaking, but this clean generation. The, what basically, this is something that's also um, uh, allowed and, and enabled in, in some countries in Europe, uh, mainly um, I, I can think of Germany with their energy efficiency program. So cogeneration will mean, for example, to use the excess heat from a boiler that, of course, runs uh, on, on fossil fuels, but they, they, they uh, take advantage of these uh, excess heat and, and and direct this uh, steam through a, um, through a power generator to um, to make the most of this uh, of, of this um, of this thermal energy that they have here. This is uh, something that's interesting to, to to study. There's only one system. Um, maybe we'll see. I, I don't really know why uh, this hasn't uh, picked uh, up more interest, but. Uh, Diversity in, in these uh, alternatives is interesting, so that's why I, I thought it would be good to point that out. Again, it's not renewable generation, but it's also a clean um, energy that you can, uh, that, that you can uh, incorporate. And actually, the, the, um, what's interesting here is that the, mechanism, the net billing mechanism works perfectly for this because it's intermittent. Uh, you're not always using or operating your boiler. Uh, but when you have excess energy, you're selling that energy at the um, the energy cost, so uh, there's no impact to the to the grid. Let's continue with uh, Guatemala. In uh, Guatemala, uh, you see that the growth is very steady over the past few years. Again, as I said, 2020 information is partial. But uh, they have a net metering um, mechanism with a maximum uh, allowed um, capacity of 5 megawatts. But again, average system size is uh, close to 7 kilowatts. So, so far, they have, uh, they probably, they'll probably reach the 4,000 installations um, this year. And uh, they're over 25 megawatts uh, already. Let's look at um, Uruguay, also our neighbors here. So um, Uruguay, again, you see the trend. If you um, go back to um, especially Brazil and Mexico, you see that the curve is uh, really, it's a lot more exponential. Uh, in the case of uh, Uruguay and Guatemala that we just saw, the trend is very stable, uh, which uh, which is also very good because uh, it, uh, it helps um, to, to have a more um, sustained and, and, uh, and, and organic growth of the, of, the, of the offer of the market, right, of the solar installations market. Uh, sometimes it's hard for the market to, um, well, of course, it's, it's a lot better when you have a high growth because uh, the market will somehow adapt to, to, to meet demand. But, uh, but it's also something that, uh, that might be that you might might be worried about what happens if that uh, growth uh, slows down, then uh, the expectations will change. So for expectations and market growth, 
steady uh, growth is is great. We see that they're incre they increased uh, 20 percent both in installations and capacity over uh, 2019. We don't have 2020 numbers uh, yet, but uh, we already know that they are over 21 megawatts um, of installed capacity. Technology-wise, they have some. Uh, I, I, if I recall uh, well, it was about 27 kilowatts in six. Uh, wind projects and uh, there's one biogas project of uh, 30 um, kilowatts, but, uh, but mostly solar PV is, um, is dominating this. Uh, I'm sorry, the there's a biomass uh, project of uh, 70 kilowatts, but then again, solar PV um, dominates the, the market. Now, last uh, but not least, uh, we have Argentina, the newcomer. Uh, the smallest, uh, the, 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 the little brother here in, in, in Latin America just starting to implement uh, this regeneration. Um, but so we only have the information from one year. The first uh, installation happened in June 2019. Uh, but so far, we have uh, 1.6 megawatts of installed capacity. What I, uh, what I estimated there is the um, the first semester of 2020 uh, for uh, the increase. Of course, this is a very very new market. Uh, I, I I'm not sure we can extrapolate uh, and say that we'll we're gonna have a 130. I'm uh, sorry, a 300 percent increase or 250 percent increase in in installed capacity this year. I guess we'll find out by the end of the year. But uh, but it's good growth, um, and we'll see. Uh, you, you know what they say about the, 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 the youngest uh, sibling, that they learn fast. They learn from, from, from the rest. So uh, we're hopeful to see what happens in the next uh, coming years, uh, by the end of this year especially. So here in Argentina, we have net billing uh, as well, the same system as uh, Chile, or very similar, but uh, with a maximum system size of two megawatts, uh, as you see, the average system size, uh, we see the same trend. So it's, a, it's around 10 kilowatts, uh, very, very uh, far away from the maximum uh, authorized by the regulation. So far, we've had 100% solar PV, although uh, there is a couple of, of uh, wind uh, um, systems that I, I, that, that, that I know I've, I've heard are uh, about to, that are, are actually under authorization now. So. Something that's also interesting uh, here, or worth mentioning, but we're going to talk about uh, this tomorrow more in detail, is that um, Argentina has uh, tax credit certificates implemented uh, that uh, at this moment are around 0.4 USD um, um, dollars per watt. Uh, if you compare that to the averages that, again, we're going to see on Friday, where I'm going to show you the latest uh, price trends uh, for, for different size of systems on Friday, but it, it could go between 20 and 30% of, um, of, of, the, of the total cost. Uh, so this is very attractive, especially for commercial industrial um, users. Something also worth mentioning here in Argentina is that um, before the national law in Argentina, um, a couple of uh, provinces uh, already had uh, some regulation for DG, namely um, Mendoza, Salta, and uh, Santa Fe. And uh, I, I don't have a lot of public information, but roughly the, what's been uh, what, what's been publicized is uh, that among the three, there's there, there's probably around 2.5 megawatts additional that were uh, enabled before the, the the national law came into implementation so that would make about four megawatts today of installed capacity in Argentina. When we look at sectors um, we see the trend that we mentioned earlier so residential makes uh, most of the installations but it's not the most of the installed capacity C and I makes the most and also interesting here is that the uh, public buildings are installing um, a, a considerable amount 
of um, of solar uh, PV mostly, and uh, this is something that included in the law, and um, that uh, new public buildings should uh, incorporate, of course, whenever it's possible, but should incorporate this three generation, um, and also there should be the, the the installation of these systems on existing public buildings should be analyzed. These are systems that were already installed that were authorized now. But um, I hope to see this uh, this number uh, or this 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 uh, trend in public uh, installations to increase again. Here you can see there's a link um, below this slide, and you can check all the information about the Argentinian regulation. And also there's a monthly reports issued by the Secretary of Energy uh, with the, the the progress of this implementation. So. Just to, to have a, a, a perspective, a regional perspective, this includes only the countries that uh, we, we saw today from the data that uh, have, have been analyzing. But I think we can, we can have a very conservative estimate that by the end of 2020, we, we will have 4.5 gigawatts of installed DG capacity in, uh, in Latin America. And again, I said these countries, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, 2020 information, uh, we don't have, in some cases, we don't have any information. In other, in, in other cases, it's uh, partial. Um, I don't have the, 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 time, uh, the time details, the timeline for Panama, for example, but I know Panama has at least 37 megawatts of distributed generation, uh, around 900 systems. So, there's a there's been a, a, a very big growth and this is a this is a, a, a sector that's uh, clearly clearly uh, here to stay. With the with last year increase uh, of 125 percent, so more than doubling installed capacity. Again, thank you Brazil and Mexico <laughs> for, uh, for for these numbers. We'll see we'll see what other countries can do to. To, to help increase uh, in the coming years. So now, just uh, closing um, the discussion and, uh, and and before going into questions, some things that we see here on all these um, on, on all these uh, trends and lines is that there's a clear growth trend of uh, distributed generation in Latin America. The, the growth trend, it's, it's mostly fueled, in my opinion, it's mostly fueled by PV cost reduction. Uh, we see that most of the installed capacity uh, has been happening after 2015, and we continue to see prices uh, dropping. And as, I, as we mentioned at the beginning, they're expected to continue dropping. So this is something that's going to stay. But also, policy has a, has a big impact um, in this case. As, I, as we mentioned, or we saw uh, all along the presentation, the maximum allowed size doesn't matter as much as uh, as we thought initially, and this is something that uh, that worried uh, a lot of regulators when trying to to foresee what's go what was going to happen with the with the sector, because of course it's uh, very different to uh, to. To, to estimate the impact of uh, a lot of small um, distributed uh, installations than on the grid, especially than having, you know, a, a large, um, I don't know, for example, Brazil, a large five megawatt system. But then we see that this is not the case and, and other constraints are in place. So I think uh, by, by increasing the maximum size, um, you might be taking advantage of, of, of some other systems that otherwise will not have been uh, made possible. And uh, if this is all for self-consumption, the impact to the grid, we're going to discuss a bit more uh, tomorrow, but the input, impact to the grid is not as large as it seems, especially with, uh, with, lower, uh, with low penetration levels. So I think maximum size uh, or, or large maximum size um, systems is a good thing, provided you can, uh, you can control with other um, restrictions or regulations uh, which users or where in the grid these uh, these systems are installed, but should not be a worry for regulators going forward. Then flexibility and options. 
are beneficial for, for, for capturing all the possible opportunities. Of course, we know solar PV is 99.9% of uh, installed capacity in most cases, but as we saw, in some cases, they, they are taking advantage uh, on biomass, biogas, some hydro, some wind, and uh, of course, with all the safety and, uh, and, and technical um, regulations in place, uh, just making sure that the impact to the grid is kept, um, uh, is, is kept under control. I think it's a good, it's a good uh, idea to, to try to be flexible and forward looking in these regulations because the technology is changing very quickly and uh, we, we don't know what's happening, but it's happening. So in the case of solar, as we mentioned, um, and we're going to talk about me, this on, on Friday, but just to, to give an advance on that, if the price of solar continues to, to decrease, as we know, um, you can buy solar panels, um, in many cases, even online, you can purchase a solar kit, any consumer can purchase a solar kit, and there's little you can do to avoid that. So in the past uh, few years, the it, it was not economically they didn't make any economical sense because the, the the solar systems cost more than the price of energy that you are paying to your distribution utility but now that is getting equal or even going uh, under depending on your retail rates uh, whatever you are this is something that's going to happen so this might happen with other technologies and uh, i think the regulation should uh, focus on really analyzing what the impact of these technologies are and enabling these technologies in a proper manner. Um, then again, as a, as a preview for uh, our discussion tomorrow, we see net metering versus net billing. And uh, if we compare the cases that we saw today with, for example, Brazil and Mexico against um, Chile and Argentina, we see that the growth in, um, in, Chile, in Brazil and Mexico has been much uh, larger, of course. If your excess energy is rewarded at retail rates for the consumer, uh, that, 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 that seems great. But then again, there are other things that uh, might come into play. And I don't know if you're familiar with this discussion, but you probably have seen uh, this happening. So basically, the same mechanism, net metering, uh, is loved by consumers and solar installers, but then distribution utilities uh, are not so much uh, for it. Uh, this has, um, mainly has to do with uh, the, the fixed uh, costs of the grid and how you distribute this uh, fixed cost over your consumers, um, which in the, in, in the short term with very few installations might not be a problem, but in the medium term, uh, in the midterm, you, you might have to start uh, rethinking your steps. Again, tomorrow we're going to have a, a more detailed uh, discussion on what are the uh, pros and cons of each of these uh, mechanisms but uh, but I think it's interesting to see that what works for for some of the the, the actors does not work so so well for others and I think uh, if this technology as we saw is here to stay and it's going to have a, a growth it, it, it there's a growth perspective for the coming years it's very important to analyze all the different impacts and aspects uh, rather than just um, consumer attractiveness. So um, with that, um, that's the end of my, my, my presentation today, and I think we can uh, open for questions. So many thanks, Ignacio. Uh, we have some questions that I would like to share with you. Uh, first, from Victor Hugo, uh, do you have information on which countries in Latin America already implemented remote net metering? Well, as, as far as I know, uh, I've only seen the case of, of Brazil. I'm not sure um, if, if other countries are not implementing this. But also, if I can expand that, uh, I think this is something today, this is something that, uh, I mean, today I mean with uh, today's technology costs, uh, this is something that might only work on net metering uh, markets um, because on net billing all your injections or your excess energy from the uh, generation generation side will uh, will be credited to the consumer but at a generation price and not uh, retail price 
Uh, I've seen a few in the in other uh, markets, uh, namely, I think one of the first uh, times I've heard about this uh, mechanism was New York uh, in the US, uh, but, uh, but I have not seen this in, in Latin America a lot. Okay, another one from Ruben. Uh, could you comment on what do you know about the development of distributed generation in Peru? I, I have not uh, I have not had the chance to analyze uh, the the Peruvian market uh, yet, but uh, if uh, I, I I would love to take a look and then maybe we can comment uh, on that in the future. I, I I try to cover most of the markets in uh, 45 minutes. I hope uh, uh, you, you understand I could not be as uh, as extensive as I want, but uh, maybe maybe in the coming webinars um, we can we can uh, incorporate. Peru, and as I said, Panama, uh, El Salvador, Colombia, that, uh, that I have not seen much uh, public information yet, but uh, hopefully it will be available soon and we'll, we'll be able to take a peek on what's happening there. That will be great. Uh, thank you, Ignacio. Another one from Hernan. Why the average size uh, for this distributed generation is in general low compared to the maximum may I allow for distributed generation installation, maybe uh, maybe because the medium is not feasible economically for distributed generation. Well, there's a lot of things that come into play, but just to start with the with the most obvious um, uh, the most obvious response will be that uh, for uh, for a two megawatt uh, system, you probably need about between two and three hectares. Of, uh, of surface available next to your next to your consumption um, point. Uh, so, if you if you think of real buildings and real uh, sites of installations, the the available uh, surface tends to be a constraint in these cases. So, uh, for example, if you look at the commercial building, there's maybe a lot of offices in different uh, floors, but then the roof. Uh, it, it's, it's just one for the entire building and they don't have that much space. Um, then again, uh, well, there's a lot of obstructions uh, as well. You have HVAC systems and tanks and all kinds of things or antennas uh, that, that could also reduce your size uh, available. Something that's also um, interesting to analyze if you're looking at a country in particular and you want to see where the opportunities are or what why each of these segments is growing more than others is to look at the uh, tariffs or retail rates because uh, retail rates are not the same uh, we're going to talk a bit about subsidies um tomorrow but we, for example in, in mexico uh residential uh or in particular small residential uh consumers have a more subsidized uh, tariff than large residential or commercial industrial users. So um, even if the, the, the cost of technology, well, the cost of technology will also be a little bit more expensive on the smaller size, but then even if the cost of, the, of technology was the same, uh, the payback or, or, or the, the payback period for, for the installations with the higher retail rate of electricity will always be, will always look better. So I think what you need to look at, of course, there's physical constraints, as we said, the surface that you have available, but also, or maybe there are some regulatory conditions that you have to meet, but mostly uh, I think that the, the retail rates have a, a very big role in which sectors develop first or, or more than others. Many thanks, Ignacio. Uh, another one from Bernardino. Are solar thermal systems uh, included in solar technologies in your graph? Uh, is its participation significant? Oh no! Well, that's a that that that's a good question, and uh, and no, we're only talking about um, on grid um, distributed generation. So it's all electrical here. What we have discussed. Um, what uh, what you mentioned? This question uh, brings me to the to to the comment that there's a lot of off grid. Uh, solar PV that is not here in this presentation, but many countries have a lot of that, and, and that's actually it, it mostly depends on uh, on what uh, grid coverage you have. You, you you might have a good opportunity to 
avoid um, investments in, in, in really long uh, uh, distribution lines if you can, uh, if you can provide uh, some incentive for solar, uh, for off-grid solar. I uh, know solar thermal um, is, is not included in this presentation, but it's also something that really, that's really interesting to look into. Okay, another one from David. What's the impact of net, uh, net metering on electric uh, companies with fixed costs? Uh, okay, well, uh, we're going to discuss this uh, tomorrow more in detail. We're going to compare feed-in tariff, net metering, and net billing. Um, and then, and then we'll, we'll be able to see what happens and, uh, and, and why uh, that there's some, some discussions that happen with the metering and not with the billing and, and so on. So I, I, I will ask you to, to join us tomorrow at the same time and, uh, and uh, I hope to answer your question in detail then. Uh, we have another question related to the topic that you mentioned. So I think that tomorrow we will cover this uh, about uh, net metering, metering and net billing so we can compare. Uh, for today, uh, I think um, we have all the questions answered. So I will share with you so you can uh, write uh, the answers and we can uh, share the, the answers with the participants on the web. So for today, uh, many thanks to all of you. It was a great presentation and we will see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Quito time. Hey. Thank you all for coming and for the great uh, questions and comments. And um, see you tomorrow. Looking forward to, to continuing this discussion. Many thanks, Ignacio, and many thanks to all of you. See you tomorrow.